Good morning, everybody. Just want to say one thing real quick. I really love you. No, seriously. No, really. Clifford, I love you, man. You guys are just amazing. I love your hearts. I love your passion. I love your commitment. I just love you for what you carry, man. I'm so proud of you. And I believe with all my heart that the days, months, years to come, your life, if you'll allow it, is being set up right now for a special assignment that's going to bring the kingdom of God to earth in a way that we've never seen before. Right? Okay, he's looking for, he's looking for individuals that will say yes. Betty, he's looking for individuals that will say yes, pull out the root, and give him permission to fill that void with the person of Holy Spirit. There's so much going on in the atmosphere right now that it's hard to even explain. I'm not, you know, I was just telling Pastor Craig that sometimes the message in a gathering like this isn't a spoken word, like an official, formal message, sermon. It's actually in the experience of the family. We're experiencing something in the realm of the glory this morning that you can't really, you can't really uh, put a value on because... Holy Spirit is so precious that when he shows up the way he showed up this morning, and I have to say, he shows up often here. But may I throw caution to the wind. Don't take advantage of his presence. Don't become comfortable with what yesterday's manna tastes like. Because every time we gather, we gather with a hunger and a desperation and a desire for him to manifest himself however he chooses. It's not according to my schedule or my agenda or what we put down on a piece of paper that says, this is what's going to happen. I want my will to be in submission to his will. He's to be the Lord of our lives, not just the director, not just like the savior of my soul, which he is, but he's to be actually be given permission to be the Lord, the director, the one that takes me wherever he wants me to go if I'm willing to follow his lead. So when we gather like this, I can promise you something that you never know what's going to happen because we're not bound to a script. And if you live by a script, the only script that you need is the word of the Lord, the Bible, God's holy word, the Holy Spirit speaking to you. When you live in that kind of, a, of an awesome tension between this world and, and the, the supernatural realm, it's an exciting life. I want to paint a picture this morning before we go. I want to paint a picture because I believe that it's still etched in my heart. It's been etched in my heart for probably 30 years, maybe longer. We've fought for it. We've sought after it. We've desired it. We've hungered for it. And I believe we're on the precipice of seeing it throughout San Diego to the north, the south, the east, and the west. I believe that God is raising up an army. He's raising up an army of Christ followers that say yes to him and his ways and say yes to whatever it is he's asking of us that we're willing to say yes to his will and to his ways not not yesterday's manna not yesterday's move not even last week's move but today's move what is he asking of us the picture that I've had for a long time is very simple I've dreamt I've seen in my mind's eye even tasted of it on occasion of not just a congregation, but the body of Christ living for the purposes of the Father to such a degree that signs and wonders become the norm, not the exception. That it's not, it's not an oddity when we see someone raised from the dead. That we read in the scripture that they had a handkerchief that was anointed of the Lord, and that handkerchief brought healing. Well, I don't know how that works, but all I know is this. There was something supernatural about that moment when that handkerchief was used to bring the manifestation of healing. I've seen some pretty cool things. Cindy Jacobs, one of my new, my new favorite people. Man, she was crazy. You guys, honestly, she gave Candy a word, a prophetic word, that I just still kind of go, no, it's... It's Candy's word, not my word, because it was just weird. It was like, it was not weird. Well, it was weird because it was outside my grid. How many ever had a word prayed over you that was just outside your, 
your grid. Like it just, well, I will say this. I need to, I need to remind me to come back to Cindy Jacob. She did say something about you that I want you to hear. Matter of fact, all of it was about you, really. But she did talk about that God was going to uh, begin to free up this family financially. Yeah. That he was going to break off. Tim, where's Tim? Tim Bennett. Where'd he go? Tim, you upstairs? Tim, Tim texts me later. He goes, I, I claim that word for me. Breaking off generational poverty. Yeah. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Breaking off generational poverty, not just financially, but the way we think. So we can step into the promises of God, which are yes and amen. We can be everything that God's calls to be because we're not allowing uh, a financial burden, debt loads, and in, in that, that burden of our finances, what we don't have, to keep us from stepping into what God's promised. Matter of fact, I have to just tell you that I believe that's part of what God's doing in our lives right now. I, my, my, my baby, not Mackenzie, my Jeep, My other baby went home to be with Jesus this past week. Yeah. 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 Kenzie, Kenzie is still alive and well and kicking. Yeah, she's still here. But, but normally, normally my, my default mechanism would go, okay, well, how am I going to get something else? How am I going to be, how am I going to, do I need to get another loan? What am I going to do, right? And I'm not going to spend the thousands this time around fix my Jeep. I don't, know what, I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know what the transportation is going to look like. I just, I just have this sense I used to be okay. Just okay. He'll take care of this, right? It's a word for you. He's going to take care of you. It's okay, right? It's okay. Your circumstances, he'll take care of you. So City Jacobs prophesied, and, and this, is, this is what I want you to hear in part of the vision, is that it's, it's the hunger that God's looking for. He's looking for people that are hungry and thirsty for the more of God, for the more of his kingdom. And I've had a dream that God would, would, would allow congregations like this one and others that would be so hungry for the presence of God that we would allow him to interrupt whatever he wants to interrupt our gatherings. That it wouldn't be simply about preaching, but it would be about you being a message, about you being a carrier of the glory, about you being a person that understands the dynamics of God, that what's inside of you is so powerful, so impactful, that wherever you go, dolls, wherever you walk, in the marketplace, in the public square, when you leave this house, you don't, you don't leave this house having not been filled up. You leave filled to spill. I saw the author of that phrase yesterday, Bill Dew. He always lets me know, you stole my phrase. I go, I did, and I'm proud of it, brother. <laughs> proud of it. I stole a lot of things like that. We're filled to spill. And when we begin to spill our lives out, like Christ spilled his blood out for you and I, when we begin to give ourselves in a capacity that we've never known before, I promise you this. This thing that's happening in San Diego right now is exponentially going to begin to increase. Last night, Candy was uh, coming on her way home, and it was about 11, 11.30 or so, 11 o'clock, whatever it was. And I was watching on um, uh, Amazon Prime, there, there's um, this, I don't know what you call it, documentary, I guess you could almost say, of the early days of contemporary Christian music. It's called First Love. And the reason I watched it is because I was on the tail end of that whole Jesus movement thing. I remember it, uh, but my brothers, both 10 and 12 years older than me, they were in the middle of it, but I was still younger, but I still remember, I still remember those days. And I remember the music as well in the early 70s when, when uh, the Jesus movement was still in full swing, actually just really getting some wind in the sail. And I remember these groups coming out, and I wanted, I wanted the music. My mom would buy me the music. Some of you might remember the groups called Love Song, Mustard Seed Faith, uh, Daryl um, Mansfield, um, so many super, uh, uh, second chapter of Acts. These will be a lot of, many of you, there'll be names you don't have a clue about, but let me tell you why it intrigued me. Not only do I remember listening to that music, but what I was intrigued by was what, what the culture was like when they began to be musicians that played for Jesus. We've labeled it contemporary Christian music, 
But we've forgotten something. They didn't start out wanting to become contemporary Christian musicians. They started out simply wanting to play their music, their guitars, their drums, whatever the instrument was, and sing about what Jesus did for them in the midst of a revival that hit our country. And they, and they would do little things in between the different groups or the different individual that was talking about their experience during that day. And here's what I remember hearing. They showed what the culture was like. And one of the musicians began to articulate what it was like to be a Christian in the midst of that culture. And I to tell you something. If we took the culture of that day and we fast forwarded to 2018 and, and did an overlay of the culture of today, they would look very, very similar. The reason I say that is because I watched it, not looking for the old days. No, I didn't even, I mean, the music then was okay, but I loved the heart of the musicians, and I loved the heart of the Jesus people. And what I feel like you need to hear today, this is a part of the dream, and this is where I want to land the plane, and that's just to go home and just be who God's called us to be as a family, is this. That's, that, that Jesus movement, the Jesus people, what was happening in the 70s, how God was beginning to use the hippies and the crazies and the flower children and all of them to begin to change the culture to a belief in Christ and living for Jesus, that day is now upon us again. We're in the midst of a second Jesus people movement. Did you hear what you said? We're in the midst of another Jesus people movement. And the question for us, as we dream about what it can look like, it says, it says in uh, 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 Haggai, Haggai chapter 2, I think it's verse 9, it says that the glory of the latter will be greater than the former. If you know anything about the passage, it's simply saying that Solomon's temple was amazing. And when it was rebuilt, because it was destroyed, it was rebuilt years and years later, that there was a generation that went in to help rebuild that temple. And to that new generation, that new temple was amazing. But for a generation to remember what Solomon's temple looked like and how it was constructed, they were kind of reveling in, well, it's not quite like what the old, the old temple was. But the new generation came in and said, we love this new temple. I'm telling you, the Jesus movement of old was good. But there's a movement coming right now in this generation and in this hour that will be like we've never known before. And what we tasted of this morning is just a small touch of what God is going to do not just inside the walls of a building, but you're going to begin to see the manifest presence of God in operation outside the walls, in the marketplace, in the public square, in your neighborhoods, in the cubicle, in your job. God's glory is going to be greater than it's ever been before because sons and daughters are functioning in their proper role. That's the dream I have, is to see a people like you function in your gifting, function in your sons and daughters' uh, 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 identity, not letting the past dictate your today, but recognize that God's called you to the greater things. I dream of a day that every young person, every young adult in this room will say, I'm going to work, I'm going to serve, I'm going to slave, if you will, for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There's a worship movement happening in San Diego right now that many of you are even aware of. There are houses literally being filled with young people worshiping for hours inside of homes. It's not about the message. It's not about who it is. It's, it's not about the house. It's about the hunger of a generation. I'm asking you this morning, some of you, how hungry are you for the more of God? If I'd have had a chance, I would have preached a little bit more on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because some of you in this room need something new. You need a refreshing in your heart. You need something that just propels you to a new place in God. I want to encourage you. I want to put wind in your sails this morning for some of you. Some of you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. By the way, we are a church that believes in that. And some of you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, but you've sat on it. You set in the gift. You don't use the gift. You don't speak in an unknown tongue. You don't speak in a heavenly language. You just let it sit there. 
Well, I'm telling you today, stir up the gift that's inside of you. Begin to pray in the spirit like you've never had before. Begin to walk up and down your neighborhood. He said, that's a weird thing. It's supposed to be weird because it's not of this world. It's of a supernatural level. It's of a supernatural nature. The one thing that he chose to redeem on this physical body was the tongue. You know why? Because the tongue is the most fierce member of our body. It's the one thing that gets most of us in trouble. We talk too much. We say too much. We say things we shouldn't say, and it gets us in trouble. And God said, I'll give you a gift. I will redeem your tongue. I'll give you a language that's only of my heavenly world, not of this world. I've gone across, you know, I've been to Argentina. I've been to different places across the globe. Everywhere I've gone, I've heard people speaking in a language that was not of their own. It wasn't their native tongue. It was a heavenly language. I'm telling you, it's supernatural. It's universal. So you need it. You want to walk in this stuff, you need it. You need to walk in power. The dynamics of God. The power of God. He's a good God and he wants to bestow his gifts on you, son and daughter. The time is now for us to rise up and become who he's called us to be. Stop living for what you once knew. This morning, roots were pulled out. Roots were pulled out. The Holy Spirit filled the void. Unbelief was ripped out of some of you. Now love, I love what Doc brought out that became the spirit of unbelief raised up to become a sword to operate in the opposite spirit of what once was dominating how you thought. See, the only thing that keeps us from walking in signs and wonder, wonders is you. That's all. I know. You say, what happens if I pray for someone that doesn't get healed? So? You know how many times it's happened? So many times I pray for someone, nothing happens. Like, how come when... What's his face? Praise. People just like, you know, cancer flees their body. You know, what was once crooked is no longer crooked. You know, see me praying for that one right there. Right? I mean, I'll tell you why. It, well, I don't know why people don't get healed, but it doesn't matter. You know what really matters? It's your obedience. You know, like Bill Johnson says it this way. He said, you know, sometimes you stop far short of the possibility that exists that the next time you pray for that person to get healed, they're going to get miraculously healed, but you chose to walk in unbelief and chose not to pray for that person. And therefore, because you didn't pray for them, their healing may not have come through you. It may come through someone else, but you miss out on the blessing and the amazing result of your faith being released. Maybe it's going to take you a hundred times to pray for someone's healing, and on that hundred time, that sign, that wonder manifests in them, you're like, ha, 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 wow. I've got healing hands. There was some crazy stuff this last weekend. Um, you know, if you've ever seen this before, I know it's strange, but signs and wonders, man. Uh, people had oil in their hands. You know, like, you say, what is that for? I don't know. Some of this stuff is just like, just makes you wonder. But I don't care. I don't, I don't care. It's, it's, it's not this. It's, it's this. Right? He can do whatever he wants. We've seen, you know, we've seen gold teeth. We've seen oil. We've seen stuff, Right? But you notice at Crosspoint, we don't focus on the stuff. Have you noticed that? Five of you noticed that. <laughs> Are you all brand new? I mean, I don't think you're all brand new. We don't focus on that stuff. What we focus on is the healing. We focus on the person. We focus on the restoration of life. We focus on, on God's promises, which are what? Yes and amen, to come alive in us. See, the stuff comes and goes, but Holy Spirit doesn't. He resides inside of you. He loves you. He loves me. And I'm believing for the day that not only will you walk in a level that you've never walked in before, but I'm praying that you will begin to impart your passion, your conviction, your love for Jesus to others. Where'd your mom go? Is she still here? she have to leave? Ah, oh, I was going to... It's all good. I was going to talk about Ashley's mom, Karen. She just so... She, huh? She's, she's just an amazing person. She's, she's what we, would, we could use as a, uh, 
uh, an illustration of, of what happens when a person truly comes to Jesus and they're transformed from the inside out. What once was is no longer. What now is shall forever be. And that's Jesus lives inside of her because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And she really believes that God is on her side and wants to use her and wants to grow her. And she, I really believe she wants to, in a class, she's like, I want whatever God wants. I just love that hunger, man. Can I just pray a, a real simple prayer? Father, I pray you'd fill this house full of hungry hearts. I pray you'd fill it full of, 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 of hungry hearts that don't know you yet, but will come to know you. I pray when they come to know you, God, they'd be so desperate and so hungry for the more that they would, they would walk around, run around, get crazy, not knowing etiquette in church. You'd be like, don't worry about the etiquette. etiquette. Just go after Jesus. I pray that we would just get so full of those Jesus freaky kind of people, not only them coming, but us. I pray the prayer of impartation this morning. God, may we be a house full of Jesus freaks. I know that's not the best English, but so what? I like it. For though you remember DC Talk, that's a good song. I want to be a Jesus freak. I pray in the name of Jesus as we leave here today, we, we would go with this uh, uh, sense that you love us, not just as a whole, but you love every single one of us individually as though we're the only one in the room. Because I've said it before, I'm his favorite. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm his favorite. But I want you to go right ahead and say, no, 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 no. I'm his favorite. And the beauty of that is we're all his favorites. So God, I thank you for this family. I thank you for this house. I thank you for your goodness and kindness to us, your people. I pray as we leave today, Jesus, we would be reminded, not just occasionally, but often, of how good you truly are, that you're a good dad, that you love us so much. Father, I, I, a moment ago, before I got up, I felt like the Lord whispered to my ear, and I'm really trying to give Holy Spirit permission to take over my senses and begin to speak into my natural senses, because I really want them to be heightened so he can use my thoughts, my feet, my, my emotions, my, my eyes, my, my, my sight and smell and just all. The, I, I, I ask Holy Spirit if this was him or not. I'm going to pray this prayer. So just before we go, Father, I feel like there's no revival without family being at the center. I feel like you are doing something in families. And so, Father, this morning... I've been praying in the natural, but I want to pray supernaturally for families. I pray for husbands and wives that behind closed doors, they're warring, they're fighting, their struggles. I pray, Holy Spirit, for your anointing to come and put a salve on their heart and heal whatever the brokenness may be. I pray, God, that marriages would be restored. I pray for sons and daughters of those marriages, God, that they would begin to see the effect of Jesus being the center of their marriage. And that, Father, you would truly do something supernatural in, in each individual, the husband and the wife. And that, God, you'd heal both hearts so the two hearts that are to be one in marriage can truly become unified. In the name of Jesus, I plead the blood over their lives and over their families. And I pray, God, that more and more we begin to see redeemed families. We see the restoration of marriages, the restorations of sons and daughters coming home. I pray, God, we begin to see something we haven't seen maybe ever in the history of the church as it relates to family. I bless, in Jesus' name, every person here this morning. Amen. Amen. Amen.